everyone, and welcome to Pearls On, Gloves Off. I'm your host, Mary O'Carroll. And today, we are going to find out what's the deal with lawyers. My guest today is the amazing Dr. Larry Richard. He is the leading expert on the psychology of lawyer behavior. He advises law firms on leadership, management, teams, change management, talent selection, and so many other things. Having gathered personality data on thousands of lawyers, Larry is well known for his insights on the lawyer personality, which he refers to as, quote, the lawyer brain, something that I've personally referenced a lot, you may have heard, uh, in many of my talks as well. So I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Welcome, Larry. Well, thank you, Mary. Good to be here. So Larry, you know, we go back many years. I have heard you speak several times now. And what I love about it is each time I always learn something new, I learn something very useful, and I always laugh a lot. So no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, though, it's, this is such a great topic, right? So many of us in the legal ops space or just generally in the legal ecosystem, right, be it at a vendor or consultant, we come into this world as non-lawyers. And frankly, none of us kind of knew what we were in for. I, you know, I just chatted with one of my uh, many new mentees last week. She's brand new to running a legal ops function at a huge, big name household company. Um, but she comes from a finance background. And so she's telling me how she's approaching these projects with data and analytics and reasoning. And literally her first question to me was, what is the deal with these lawyers? You know, they don't listen. They don't want to do any of the things. And they just tell me that everything is going to fail. She's like, I've, I've never worked with people like this before. And I just, I kind of chuckled because I've been there, right? And my response to her was, oh girl, <laughs> you are in for a rude awakening, right? These aren't regular people. These are lawyers. You've, you've got to learn to treat them differently. Um, but, but in all seriousness, that, that's a lot of what you've taught me, right? You've taught me that there are reasons for this and how to win at it. And I think you know, sometimes I feel like it might be insulting when I say stuff like this because I'm not a lawyer. And, you know, we all say we can't, no one can insult our families except ourselves. But you, you're actually a trained lawyer. And so you've kind of been studying them uh, for a long time. I'd love to hear your reactions to that story, but also hear how you kind of went from being a lawyer to studying them and understanding what makes them tick. So let's let's actually start with the background, because I think that will help uh, give context to the rest of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Uh, yeah, great. I did. I did practice law. I actually came from a family of lawyers going back three generations. My grandfather was a classic Philadelphia lawyer and my father, uncles, aunts, cousins. The family was just filled with lawyers. And so I just never even thought of any other career. I went uh, from high school to college to, you know, pre-law in college and went right to law school. And from day one, I really didn't like law school, uh, but I stuck with it, you know, because it was kind of the family business. I got out. I got a very good job with the government. I, uh, you know, was a litigator, uh, practiced for not even a year and a half. And I just said, I got to get out of here. And I just started jumping from job to job to job. I don't think I held any job longer than 18 months. And most of them were shorter than that. And finally, after 10 years of doing that, I woke up one day and I said, it's not the job, it's the career. I'm in the wrong career, believe it or not. And oh. it was just hard to accept that. But yeah. um, once I did, I said, let me do some soul searching, look through my kind of you know, past uh, evidence and see if there's anything that pops out. And what popped out was very clear. There was just a through theme that was unmistakable. I love understanding people, helping people. In other words, psychology was my calling. And so mm -hmm. at that point, I just said, you know, I'm going to go back and I'm going to get a PhD in psychology and I'm going to study lawyers. And that's wow. what I did. My doctoral research was um, what steered me accidentally into the personality field. I had, uh, in my effort to transition, the, I left out an in-between step, was, which was when I had a small law office in New York, uh, across the street from my office, across the hallway from my office one day, 
this empty office, I saw a sign painter putting a sign on the door. And it turned out that the people moving into that office were two psychologists, actually two brothers, both PhD psychologists, and they were starting a career counseling company. And I thought, wow, this is great. And I knocked on their door, sight unseen. We had a conversation. I said, do you have a lawyer? They said, no. I said, let's barter. If you teach me everything about careers, I'll teach you everything. You know, I'll, I'll do your contracts and set up some standard forms for you and blah, blah, blah. And they, yeah. they to my surprise, they said yes. So <laughs> I, ended up taking, I ended up taking the Myers-Briggs, which I had never heard of. Okay. And, uh, and I fell in love with it. So yeah. when I was in graduate school, I said, I'm going to give the Myers-Briggs to every lawyer I can think of. And my dissertation advisor wanted me to give it to like, you know, pick 40 people at a law firm in Philadelphia. And I said, no, I'm going to study 3,000 lawyers across the entire U.S. And he said, you're crazy. It'll take you 10 years to do your dissertation. And I said, no, I'm going to do it in three years. And I did. Right. Right. So, I, right. so I, <laughs> I did the study. It's the, actually the only nationwide scientifically uh, done study of lawyer personalities. And what I found shocked me. The people who go into law are dramatically different from other people. And at that yeah. time, that was in the early 90s, that was uh, you know, completely novel and surprising to me. But now, fast forward 30 years, it's the story that's continually told. I've been testing yes. lawyers for all this time, and I see this over and over and over again. We are consistently different from the general public, from what you inelegantly called non-lawyers. We all do that. Uh, yep. But I get, I get pushback from all of those people, and I like to use a term like other professionals. Right, uh, right. And the reason we call them non-lawyers is partly we've been trained to do that. And partly because lawyers, one of the things I've discovered is that we're really low in resilience. We're very insecure and thin skinned. And how do you compensate for that? You build yourself up by putting other people down, right? So Ooh. if we can refer to others as <laughs> non-lawyers, and now they've even got you doing it because they've taught the non-lawyers <laughs> to call themselves that. I know, it's, so it's terrible. They're pretty good at persuasion, you know what I mean? Um, but but I'll I'll, I'll call them uh, professionals because I think it it adds some dignity. Anyway, the the point was this insight that lawyers are different led me on a quest, which I'm still on, to try to mine the data, to try to look scientifically and study as many lawyers as I can. At this point, I've I've surveyed over twenty five thousand lawyers uh, with personality tests of different sorts, uh, all over the world. I mean, most of the data are from the U.S., but I also have lots from Canada, South America, Asia, um, Australasia, um, Europe, and the data are the same. What's interesting is a lawyer is a lawyer is a lawyer. You give me a lawyer from Hong Kong, a lawyer from Paris, a lawyer from Argentina, a lawyer from Kansas, the profile is going to look like lawyer to me before it starts looking like something from that location. Right. And, and that's, that's so fascinating. It's totally fascinating. And one of the uh, kind of early questions I had for you was, so you're studying them after obviously they've become a lawyer, you know, and they have the title of a lawyer. So they're, you know, they're grown adults and all. How much of this can we infer is nature versus nurture, right? You said that a certain profile of people are attracted to the law, but how much of it is maybe like, you know, the way we train lawyers in school and in law firms that also maybe emphasizes some of those, those qualities as, as positive and reinforces them. I mean, is that what, mm -hmm. what so, tell me more about your test. Like, how does it work? Sure. So that's a great question. And the, there are a couple of uh, ways to explain the answer, which is it's both and there is a self-selection mm -hmm. process. People who have some of these traits already self-select when they choose law school. There's also a weeding out process so that during the three years of law school, uh, lawyers who have, law students who have less lawyer-like scores, especially low skepticism, tend to drop out at a disproportionate rate, which further concentrates the high skepticism among those who remain. And then 
Um, there are certain traits, namely skepticism, resilience, and empathy, which are more learned. Most personality traits are more genetic, which means if you find lawyers with those traits in practice, they didn't become that way because the practice made them that way because the traits are pretty wired. They're, they're biologically mm -hmm. based. About 75% of the trait is contributed by our genetics and about 25% by our, by our uh, you know, social environment and, and learning. Um, the exceptions to that are the three traits I mentioned, resilience, empathy, and, and um, uh, skepticism. Those are more learned. And as a result, more exposure. Let's take skepticism. Um, this is the classic illustration. We have tested 1Ls, first year law students, and for the, the public on every trait averages at the 50th percentile. The, the test I use, the caliper profile, which is a, a much more industrial strength, reliable and valid scientific test than the Myers-Briggs. Uh, the caliper has been around since 1964. And it, it measures traits on a zero to a hundred percent scale. So mm -hmm. the, if you take any group in the public, they're going to average close to the 50th percentile. There's a little slippage, but it's always going to be between 40 and 60%, literally for each of the 18 traits. But mm -hmm. lawyers are different. Seven, I'll repeat that, seven of the 18 traits, the average score for lawyers is below 40 or above 60. That's just astonishing any way you cut yeah. it. Yeah, and so, absolutely. You know, when you look at, at that, um, those are the traits that stand out. And I've studied those in law students. So let's, let's again take skepticism. We start with a public average of 50%. So the law students are all selected from that public, but they already, the people who end up in law school already have a 10% higher skepticism score. So there's something about law school that seems to attract a little bit disproportionately people who are innately skeptical. Okay. Then we get another eight to 10% dropping out of the low skeptics, dropping out over the three years of law school. So by the time we get to those who have finished law school, the average skepticism score, instead of being 50, is about 70%. Mm -hmm. And then over the next 10 years, most of the data I have comes from partners. And partners, by definition, had three years of law school and it practiced for about 10 years, give or take. So that's 13 years. At the end of 13 years, the average skepticism score is 90%. Jeez. So you can see it keeps going up with exposure yeah. to, ex to skeptical thinking. And it started as a self-selection process. So the answer is both end. Yeah. Okay. So I'd love to get into all this because this is exactly how you describe, you know, what is the lawyer brain and kind of these qualities with, that are different than the general public. And what's great about these qualities is they actually help make you an amazing lawyer, right? There's, there's certain traits that help you in the profession. And then there might be some downsides that I often point to as the reason why we haven't seen a lot of change in our industry, not a lot of innovation. You know, this industry has kind of been stuck for a while. And I, you know, I point to that as, as one of the drivers of that. So let's start with skepticism. I'd love to hear about some of the others, but what is it, you know, about that trait that makes you a great lawyer? And then kind of what are the other uh, parts of that trait? So in order to answer that question, I have to mention that 25 years ago, the main thing that lawyers did is they practiced law. That was it. But in the last 25 years, the number of additional roles that lawyers are expected to play has increased significantly. So let me name okay. some of the other roles which lawyers play today. Manager, supervisor, mentor, leader, which is different from manager, um, yep. rainmaker, colleague, coach, a uh, committee chair, outward facing person in the community, board member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are all roles that lawyers frequently play. And literally every one of the other roles requires relationship building, which is founded upon trust. What do you think the opposite of skepticism is? Trust. Trust. Yeah. The mm -hmm. more skeptical you are, the less trusting you are of others 
but it's a reciprocal trait, which means if I'm skeptical with you, guess what I engender? I engender your skepticism in me. So if I'm going to be a good leader, I not only have to get better at trusting you, I have to lower my own skepticism, not just for my sake, but because if I'm skeptical, you're going to be skeptical. So it helps me to lower it for both myself and for you. And that's the challenge. So um, every trait has both an upside and a downside, depending on the context we're using the trait in. The basic idea is that um, every personality trait has is not inherently good or bad. It's just neutral. And yeah. depending on the context, the trait can be useful and helpful, or it can be an impediment. It can make it harder to do whatever you're trying to do. Let me give you a concrete example. Sure. If I want to be a good leader, one of the things that we know from the leadership research is that leaders take risks because the leaders are by definition operating in a world of uncertainty. So they yep. never know if what they're doing is right. So they have to try new stuff. Sometimes yep. they're wrong. Lawyers don't like being wrong ever. Right. So right. what happens if you're a risk averse lawyer and you've been put in a leadership role? You have to take risks now, whereas your previous role, your, your lawyer role, when you're wearing your lawyer hat, you have to minimize risks. When you're in your leader role, you have to at least take some risks. Sure. So what do you do? If you have a trait, there is a trait that measures your comfort with risk. It's called cautiousness. And it's actually not atypical. Lawyers uh, are distributed just like the general public. We have some high caution lawyers and low caution lawyers. But if you're one of the high caution lawyers, which is more what the reputation of lawyers is. In mm -hmm. fact, some people are shocked when I tell them there are low caution lawyers. Every firm has them, which is what <laughs> makes chief operating officers pull their hair out because the risk profile is a little high. But um, if you have some high cautiousness lawyers, they're going to be very comfortable in their role of practicing law because they're naturally cautious and they don't take risks. But when they are okay. placed in a leadership role, their comfort zone is going to be to act the, just the same way, which will kill their ability to lead. Interesting. So, so they have to step out of their comfort zone and start taking risks. And that's a learned thing. You can't get comfortable. You're just going to have to be uncomfortable. In fact, I believe, Mary, that the secret to life, if we were to find that famous mountain with the guru sitting at the top of the mountain and we climb the mountain and we finally get there and there's the guru and we say, guru, what's the secret of life? I am convinced the guru is going to say, learn to be comfortable with discomfort. Oh, I love that. You, I love discomfort. I, 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 yeah, exactly. When I coach people or mentor people, I'm always pushing them to things that uh, make them start getting uncomfortable and squirming physically in their seat. I'm like, that's what you need to be doing. So that's we need to do right. another interview to probe that in depth. In depth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and I have taken the caliper test with you, and yep. if I recall correctly, I think my personality traits were almost like the converse, the opposite of what you were finding in the general population of lawyers, which I also thought was really interesting. Um, so I, I tell myself I would make a terrible lawyer and I'm glad I didn't go down that path. So <laughs> um, what are some of the other, the other traits we've talked about skepticism? We've talked about, um, what was the last resilience. one? Resilience. Okay. Yeah. So what are lawyers are also ones? extraordinarily high in autonomy. They just don't like anyone yes. telling them what to do. Oh, and yes, even if it's a, a even if it's a benign request, even if it's good for them, if you ask them to do it, like turn in your timesheets, their immediate reaction is, oh, yeah, why should I? Mm -hmm. And part of it is autonomy. And then skepticism reinforces that. Like, why should sure. I do what you're asking? These traits, you know, interact with each other and support each other. The, th the next trait is lawyers are very high in abstract reasoning. They like using their large brains. They like solving problems. They like analyzing things. They love arguing. Yeah. They just yeah. love arguing. Um, and sometimes they get stuck in analysis paralysis, but it's basically the main thing that attracts them to the legal profession. I mean, that's what lawyers do all day is analyze and think and use their intelligence to solve problems, solve some of the toughest problems that clients bring them. So that's a, you know, a trait that has a strength 
you know, it's the strength of figuring things out and solving problems, but it's also the downside in the wrong context of overdoing it, analysis paralysis and getting stuck in your intellect. So every trait has two sides. Next, they're really high in urgency. If they're listening to this podcast right now and they're tapping their toe, they're going, okay, I get it. I'm a quick study. Come on, come on, come on, come on. That's yeah. urgency. The clock is ticking. Again, high urgency is terrific for the most part, because in a law firm, let's step outside the law department for a minute. In a law firm, lawyers who you hire, they know you want them to solve problems that have to be resolved yesterday. Yeah. And so right. they feel the time pressure. They know that the client needs it yesterday. And it it is a plus that lawyers innately want to cut to the chase. They want to be responsive to their clients. So where's the downside? What could be bad about urgency? Well, the downside is in their leadership role, leadership is a two-edged sword. Urgency is good because it helps leaders push initiatives forward, but it's bad because no leader succeeds unless they get the buy-in of their constituents. And mm -hmm. how do you get buy-in? You talk to them and you listen to them, especially, so they feel understood. They feel like you understand my point of view. And even if you don't execute on my point of view, I feel like it was taken into account. If you're urgent and you shut people down before they feel heard, you won't get their buy-in. So urgency becomes a terrible disadvantage in a leadership role in that respect. So I'll repeat that. So urgency becomes a terrible disadvantage uh, in a leadership role in that respect. Got it. Got it. Uh, I'm uh, terribly what, high on urgency as well. So I, I, I get that. And sometimes we do have to slow down and listen and get everyone kind of on the same page before we move on. And that's why we'll move on to the next few traits that I haven't mentioned <laughs> okay. already. There are All two right, traits left. <laughs> One is low sociability. Lawyers are very private and um, kind of suspicious around anything having to do with relationships or intimacy. Mm. High sociability people are people people. They're very open. They reveal a lot about themselves for the purpose of deepening a connection with people. They want to be vulnerable and they want to spend time getting to know somebody, remembering the details of another person's life and sharing those details of their own life. That's high sociability. That's high. Most okay. lawyers, most lawyers hearing me say that last sentence have already left the room because <laughs> that's me. I'm off the charts high. I love that. <laughs> of course, but that's atypical, right? So lawyers, lawyers who um, hear any words having to do with relationships or intimacy, like relationship, connection, vulnerability, empathy, they're just trigger words that make them feel threatened. And you'll hear them call that touchy feely and other disparaging things. But that's really unfortunate because the science that's emerging on the value of vulnerable, authentic connections is that it is the single most important thing that we have that produces all the outcomes that human beings most dearly want in their lives. It produces mm -hmm high levels of life satisfaction and work satisfaction and long-term relationship success and even longevity and good health. Yeah, so it's kind right. of a shame that lawyers treat it as a triviality, but that's quite widespread. And then the last trait, the one that those six traits that I've mentioned so far, high uh, skepticism, high autonomy, high urgency, high abstract reasoning, low resilience and low sociability. Those have been outliers since I started gathering this data in the early 90s. The newest trait is low cognitive empathy, taking the perspective of others. And that's only recently dropped low enough to be considered statistically an outlier. And that's been solidly an outlier for about three years or more, uh, going on four. And what it basically means is lawyers are more focused on their own goals, their own needs, their own efforts, and less inclined to put themselves in the shoes of colleagues, junior associates, clients, yeah. uh, other people. They're just not as inclined to do that. 
And that actually mirrors a drop in empathy that's been measured in the general public, particularly among millennials, people under 40. Um, so as millennials have, uh, you know, as, as the empathy level has been dropping in the general population, it's also been dropping among lawyers, again, mostly among younger lawyers. Got it. To which millennials so all- said, yeah, whatever. <laughs> That's <laughs> what they say to everything, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So this is also interesting, and I'm sure a lot of people listening are nodding their heads because there's a lot of what you're saying that resonates with the way as we are trying to innovate and make change in an industry and work with lawyers, we get a lot of resistance, a lot of pushback, right? We get the the autonomy come through when we try to tell them this is there's a new and better way to do something. It's an immediate, like, don't tell me what to do. There's the... Um, you know, the need for knowledge sharing and collaboration and that so that low sort of social, um, I forget what you called it, but, you know, not wanting to sort of be in a group and work together and collaborate. Low sociability. Uh, mm-hmm. Low sociability, right. It, you know, it starts to contribute to that where we say, no, we want you to get together and share your ideas and make templates together and agree on language. It's suddenly, well, I do my thing my own way. And, you know, we start mm-hmm. to, we start to see a lot of that as we try to make change and transformation in the departments. And, as the more I talk to to you and hear about some of these studies, it it helps me understand, you know, how to work with them, how to kind of make that change happen. Do you have tips and tricks of how to work with lawyers and like what is the approach that uh, we should take when trying to get some of this stuff done? Uh, it's hard to give you. A, a, that is one of the most frequent questions I get asked, and I have some tips for you, but I should uh, preface it by saying the tips that work best are context specific. So if you tell Mm me I'm trying to get somebody to turn in their timesheets, I can give you much more effective tips for that particular task than a generic, here are some things to do, because there's a lot of complexity in the way that you use your knowledge of these traits to help, you know, help lawyers do the right thing and so forth. I also should preface it by saying lawyers, frequently higher in their own image. So the other professionals that we've been talking about, they don't test exactly the same as lawyers, but their traits on these seven outlier scores do test in the same direction. So they do have elevated skepticism, not as high as lawyers, but you know, when I test COOs, for example, they're more skeptical than the public. Um, Uh They're less, they're lower on sociability than the public. They are more urgent than the public. They look just like mini versions of lawyers. So yeah. um, it rubs off. Whatever the lawyers have going, either it rubs off when they're working there. Skepticism certainly is vulnerable to that because it's a learned trait. Or right. the lawyers have hired people that are, hey, this person's just like me. Let's hire them. Right, right, So, right. So that yeah, should I be said. So, so what can you do to work with lawyers? Number one, the, the most important two traits, in my opinion, are high skepticism and low resilience. They are always on the table. You can never assume that you are free of those two traits. So what can you do if you know that's to be, if know that to be the case? Number one, because lawyers are skeptical, never arm wrestle a lawyer. You're going to lose. Absolutely. Instead, (laughs) Instead, know your facts and always present facts that you want to introduce in the form of a question rather than an assertion. Because an assertion, lawyers are trained to treat every assertion as a challenge, and they're going to treat the challenge not as something they accept, but as something that they now have to counter. As in, oh yeah? So instead of saying, it looks like a sunny day, Mary, where you would say, well, I don't know, it might rain later. You know, I might say, what do you think? Does it look sunny to you or not? Yeah. And it that's does. much more likely to evoke the actual, actual accurate answer. Hey, it is sunny. than if I said to you what I think it is and hope you agree with me. So, so that's the first point. Don't, don't that, ever use a frontal approach in trying to influence lawyers. You will lose. You'll, you'll do the I, opposite of what you're trying to. I love that. I just want to make one comment, which is I always say, instead of asking the lawyers, can I get some of your time to talk about a new idea that we have for your team? You, mm-hmm. you immediately get a no, right? You shut that down. Right. I always like to say, 
would you be open to a conversation where we present some ideas? And they can't mm-hmm. really say no to that. <laughs> so it's yeah. ask a question, but asking them in the right way. You can even make it um, easier for them by asking a question that um, results in their saying no, because the word no is music to their ears. They like saying no, <laughs> right? So if you say, yeah. are you open to a conversation? They still have to say yes to get into that conversation. Ooh, but if you say, would, would I be, would I be uh, disrupting you if, if we had a f- short five minute conversation? Oh no, no, not at all. <laughs> That is brilliant. Brilliant. I right? love that. So they, they like saying no. So anything you can ask them where the answer no is actually an affirming of what you want from them, you're in good shape. All right. That is that is a huge tip. Everyone should write that down. All right. What was yeah, your next yeah. one? Now, you know, the next one is low resilience. So low resilience. Let me give you the classic example of low resilience. Low resilience people are basically insecure and they hear um, any sort of a statement from someone else potentially as a criticism of themselves. So two quick examples. If I say, um, I say, um, you know, you're, you're talking too loud. My ears are very sensitive. The lawyer hears you are a defective human being. (laughs) And they're like, no, I'm not. What I want them to hear is I'm experiencing discomfort and I'm reaching out to you to see if you can adjust your behavior to reduce the amount of discomfort I'm experiencing. I'm focused on my discomfort and hoping you can reduce it. And what you're hearing is I'm focused on your character and how bad it is. Interesting. So so we don't, it's hard to, you know, even when I coach lawyers, it's hard for them to recognize the distinction I just made that they're like, uh, say that again. (laughs) So, (laughs) so, so what you want to do is not trigger that reaction in the first place. So let me give you an even more dire example, classic example. We're walking down the main street of whatever city you're in. We pass a beautiful clothing boutique and I look in the window and I say, Oh, Mary, look at that outfit in the window. You would look smashing in that outfit. Well, that's a compliment. Anybody who heard that would say, thank you, except for a low resilience lawyer. What do they say? They say, what? You don't like what I'm wearing? Oh, stop. (laughs) They, they, they immediately insert the criticism. Somehow, somehow that compliment got turned into a criticism because I have a filter of what's wrong with me. So, so that's the filter. Okay, so what do we do about that? Um, you can use what I call pre-mismatching. Um, Mary, you're probably going to tell me that this is, you know, out of line, but um, it would be so helpful if you could turn in your timesheets. Now, I'm going to disagree with you, but I've given you something benign to disagree with that this is going to be out of line, and you're going to go... Right. Oh, no, it's not out of line. I'll see what I can do. Yeah. Right? You you want to do something that puts the energy away from the thing that might make them feel insecure yeah. to something yeah. innocuous, you know, inert that they can disagree with. That's one way to defuse resilience. The other one is to talk about their criteria, what matters to this individual. So if I know that it's important to you to be well regarded by your peers, I can say, you know, I get so much great feedback about you from talking to the people that you work with. And I have a piece of feedback you probably won't want. There's a pre mismatch. You probably won't want to hear this, but based on what I've heard, this could actually help you be more well regarded by your peers. Are you interested? Yeah, of course. So I've used right. your yeah. criteria. Yeah. Being well regarded by your peers. Now I'm doing it in a very blunt, explicit way. In the example I just gave you, it can be done more subtly. But the basic sure. idea is you want to align what you're saying with something that's already the way they're thinking. And yeah. that 
bypasses the resilience trap. It's less likely to trigger that insecure thing because my saying yes to you, you now if I'm in your shoes, saying yes to Larry gets me more of what I want. So I'm more likely to say yes. Yeah. That's, right. that's a tricky one. That takes a little bit more planning, a little bit more thought. That's a little bit more the advanced course, um, <laughs> but it can be done. Yeah. So there, there is a lot to think about and it, it is, I mean, I, I, for those who are experiencing it, you know, you're, you're not crazy. There is a subtle way to sort of work with lawyers that is, that is different. And uh, especially if your role is trying to change their behavior um, and to insert yourself into the way they're currently doing their work and, you know, possibly asking them to do something very new, you're going to get met with, you know, a lot of this uh, and approaching it in a way that makes it easy on you is, is really key to your success. Absolutely. In fact, let's take one more example. Let's take high okay. autonomy. So lawyers don't want to be told what to do. Yep. Almost anything, you know, why would you be interacting with them? Usually it's because you want them to do something. That's right. Whether it's you, you know, whether it's you're doing it because uh, you're directing them because you're the leader or you're doing it because you're influencing upward and you need their help or uh, just they're up here and they have some information that you need. Uh, uh -huh. You need to do that in a way that doesn't make them get defensive. Like, I'm not going to have anyone tell me what to do. Let me give you an right. example. I was once in a, in a CLE lecture and I was bored because I didn't need CLE. I wasn't really practicing law, but I was still licensed at the time. And I'm twiddling my pen in the back of the room and it pops out of my hand and it rolls under the seat of the guy sitting next to me. And there's a, a lawyer in the front of the room lecturing. I don't want to disturb him. So I said, I lean over to this guy next to me and I said, could you hand me my pen? It rolled under your chair. And instead of handing it to me, he says, it's your pen. Get it yourself. Oh, and I said, I said, yeah, but it's under your chair. He says, yeah, but it's your pen. Well, now we're in this arm wrestle about the damn pen. And right. I realize we both have like super high autonomy. Neither of us is going to concede because it feels like we're giving in. And yep. I didn't, I didn't have any interest in controlling his autonomy. I just wanted my blankety blank pen. So I finally got on her hands and knees and picked it up, but it illustrates how easily this, this, this trait is invoked if you're a high autonomy person. So what can you do? Uh, always again, use an indirect approach. Instead of saying, I want X, you use language that's kind of uh, precatory in nature. Mary, would it be okay if, I'm sure this would be, you know, this would probably be a major inconvenience to you, but if you could find it in your heart to give me the time for five minutes to interview you, uh, or uh, it reminds me of a, a friend of mine who's from Tokyo. And I once yeah. asked her, what's the main difference you see between the U S and Tokyo? And she said, when I'm home, uh, here's how I ask for, like if I'm at a family holiday dinner with three generations sitting at the table, she said, here's how I ask for the butter. Oh, um, humble father, I am uh, so unworthy to be even taking your time to ask this question. But if you would deign in your great imperiosity to pass me the butter, I, your humble servant, would be more than eternally grateful. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something like that. And I was sure. like, you've got to be kidding. I mean, that was just, it floored me. But that's an illustration um, in an exaggerated way of the kind of uh, surrounding language that we need to use to diffuse autonomy. You want to be in the position of a humble servant asking permission to get them to do something as opposed to ordering them or requesting them or telling them to do something because the latter is surely going to trigger a defensive, oh no, you don't, heels dug in yeah. reaction. So interesting, immediately thinking about personal life and how to talk to my 12 year old to make her clean a room and such. <laughs> so this triggers a totally off the wall question, which I hope is okay to ask. Why are there so many married couples that are lawyers and lawyers? I feel like there are more lawyer, lawyer couples than any other profession. Is that just 
Is it is that a fact? Is that true? Or am I just observing something that's not really a thing? I certainly have met a lot of lawyer couples. Um, I don't have any data on that. And I don't know if it's just we tend to notice that, uh, even if it's a, a very yeah. infrequent thing, or if it's actually more common. So I have no way of knowing if it's more or less common than the public. But I do know that lawyers have one and a half times the divorce rate of the general public. That's not a good thing. Yeah. It it could be that lawyers marry lawyers, number one, because the, no, the most common way that people meet their spouse is through proximity, you know, working near them. Uh-huh. If you work around other lawyers, it's a convenient place to meet people. Yeah, um, and, it, and it might lead to those pairings. Uh, also, um, they understand each other. They speak the same language and they're less likely to misinterpret when someone uses a lawyerism, um, you know, when they say in any event, um, you know, people without legal training often go in any event, like, <laughs> what, what are you talking are you about? Talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Whereas other lawyers just go, uh, well, the answer is, and then they ignore it. it it's just a, yeah. a phrase that's quite common. So I can see Got good it. reasons for lawyers to marry each other. Uh, the challenge is staying together. Yeah. So, okay. So l- let's go back to, uh, you mentioned the changing role of the lawyer that we see. I often talk about the changing role of the general counsel. It's the same idea, right? That you have so many more uh, requirements and traits that you need to bring to the table to be successful in your role. I know that I get asked a lot, well, what classes should I take? What skill sets should I uh, get trained up on as a lawyer to improve and to be successful as the lawyer of tomorrow? And my response to that, and I have a feeling yours is the same, is it's not really a skill set thing. It's a mindset shift that we need, right? And you're nodding. Um, what, your thoughts on that? I mean, I, we, we definitely see that. We hear that. Um, and I know you talk about that quite a bit. What, what is that mindset shift needed and how do we get there? So there are a couple of mindset shifts that I think are important. Number one, in my opinion, the most important mindset, which kind of is a skill and it's a little bit related to personality, but it's to me the most important thing that we need in the world of increasingly um, volatile change that we're, we're gradually moving into or rapidly moving into. And that is the, the quality of adaptability because the world is so complex. There was an article in Harvard Business Review last year about um, frenemies, companies Mm -hmm. that are, you know, like Apple and Microsoft, they're competitors and -hmm. they also collaborate. Yep. How do you work across the aisle when you are, uh, you know, adversarial in some respects and you are contractual partners in other respects? that requires adaptability because you can't be, you can't use the same approach in both of those roles. The same is true in personality. If I am uh, a lawyer in one role and I have to be high in skepticism and I'm a leader in another role and I have to be high in trust and I, and they're the opposite of each other, I have to be able to adapt. I have to be able to take my skeptical hat off and put my trust hat on. So it's adaptability is needed in personality. Adaptability mm-hmm. is needed in the kinds of relationships that the complex world we live in are fostering today. So that's my number one mindset shift. Number two, uh, there is a deeply embedded mindset that lawyers have, partly because we're skeptical and we're pessimistic and we have a negative outlook by our training and by the personalities who go into this field. We look for problems. That's what we do. Um, That leads us to when we get outside the practice of law and we enter into the back office to how do we design um, talent programs, professional Mm -hmm. development programs? How do we recruit people? How do we retain people? How do we engage people? Those the mindset that is quite pervasive for a lot of lawyers in those professional development roles is people uh, can't be trusted. You have to uh, be skeptical about them and, you know, create rigid rules 
and check up on them. And you have to find what their deficiencies are and give them periodic feedback about those deficiencies. So you can close the gap and bring them up to the speed where they should be. Mm -hmm. That fix your deficiencies mindset is what I call for this whole package I'm describing. And it's actually yeah. been for a hundred years, the prevailing mindset in business. It's way, it's the way business has been thinking traditionally about developing people. We look, yeah. you know, we do surveys, we do assessments, we do 360s, we figure out what are your deficiencies. We give you a performance plan and we tell you what time frame. here's how you're going to improve. And what the latest research, including neuroscience research, tells us is that approach sucks. That's the technical term for it. Um, <laughs> it simply doesn't work. There's yeah. actually neuroscience research showing that it shuts down the hippocampus, which is the center in the brain for learning and memory. In other words, the very goal of doing these feedback sessions is to help people learn. And, and the way we're doing it is actually completely shutting down their learning. So it's like huh. a useless exercise. It is a totally useless exercise. What we need to do instead is to shift to a strengths-based mindset. The Gallup organization has spent 70 years or more uh, studying, researching, publishing, cultivating details about how to build a strengths-based workplace. And there's so much evidence, not only about how to do this, but about the extraordinary eye-popping payoffs for using a strengths-based approach. Two examples to illustrate. Number one, okay. Gallup's data shows that people who um, have a manager, that's the term that's used in industry, uh, that is a strengths-based manager. They focus 80% of their time, for example, on finding what you're good at and helping you get yeah. more time to use it and bringing out yes, your yes, best. Yes. Yes. Managers who have that approach have employees that are six times more engaged than people who have a fix your deficiencies approach. Oh yeah. Number two, there's a study, you may have seen it, I've used it in a number of presentations that was done in 1950. Don Clifton, who created the current modern Sixth Gallup century. organization, mm -hmm. uh, Don Clifton did this study in University of Nebraska in 1950, and they looked at speed reading and they took an average group of speed readers and a sophisticated fast group of speed readers. And they said, what would happen if we exposed both groups to the same training? And this wasn't like a, an hour of training. This was six weeks, eight hours a day of intensive yeah. speed reading training. And what they expected is the group that needed to improve the most, that is the average readers, would have the greatest benefit from this six weeks of training. Remember, they got the exact same training. So yeah. the group that was given the training that, that was in the average group, they had about an 80% improvement. They went from, I think it was uh, something like 190 words to 250, something like that. Yeah. The other yeah. group started at 350 words a minute, and that was the outstanding group. They improved to 2,900 words a minute. That's crazy. I mean, look at look at that improvement. It's hundreds and hundreds of percentile improvement points. And this made Don Clifton say, we're doing it all wrong. We can't yeah. have a fix your deficiencies approach. And he, in that moment, decided to create a strengths-based strength -based consultancy. And that's what he did. And Gallup has become, this to this day, the largest and unassailably number one global strengths-based consultancy. So strengths are an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. And you can help lawyers by focusing on their strengths, by bringing out their best. You, can, you can't eliminate skepticism, but you can quiet it down. You can't mm -hmm. eliminate low resilience, but you can build it up. You can't eliminate urgency, but you can make people really interested when they, because when people are experiencing their strengths, it brings out their best. And when people yeah. are at their best, they're more patient. They're more tolerant. They actually are more inclusive. So diversity and inclusion improves naturally, not because you've put somebody in a training program. Uh, it has all kinds of side benefits when you use a strengths-based approach. So the shift in attitude here would be to shift lawyers from 
there's something wrong with you that needs fixing to how can I spend time understanding what makes you so good at something and help you spend more time doing that and get even better at doing it. Yes, if I could make that, that shift, it would be revolutionary. That's exactly it. And that's exactly the talking point that we need to do as, as professionals trying to modernize an organization is we want to give you more time to do the things that you love and that you're great at. Thank you, Larry. As always, I feel like I learned so much from you and I'm sure that all of our listeners did as well. Such a pleasure. We could probably talk for another hour. Thank you so much for your time and for being on the show. Absolutely. My pleasure, Mary. Good catching up with you and good doing this podcast. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.